Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my Daily Ruler. Today we've got another question that was submitted by some viewers. There were actually a couple of people who put this question or various aspects of it into the chat, and I really appreciate it. So, Amy has Mesmeric Orb and Basalt Monolith in play. Now, if you have never seen this combo before, you can tap Basalt Monolith for 3 mana, and then untap it using those 3 mana, and because you untapped a permanent, you can mill a card using this Merrick Orb. So, any number of times you should be able to do that, however much you want. Now, why would you want to mill yourself a card? Well, Amy's deck also contains three Narc Amoebas and an Embercool, the Eon's Torn. The question is, can Amy mill until she has all three Narc Amoebas in play? The answer to this is, it depends. And I can't say yes or no quite yet because there's a little bit more information that we would need to know in order to get a good answer here. So, to see why this is even a problem at all, let's take a step back and examine another question that might come up. Amy controls Seeker of Skybreak and no other permanents. Her opponent is going to attack her for a lot of damage in the next few turns, and she knows she's going to lose this game. Can she? tap Seeker of Skybreak to untap itself, and continue doing that for the next however much time there is left in the round to force a draw on the game. Well, I hope that nobody out there said that that should be something that she's allowed to do, and in fact, it isn't. The reason is that if you have a bunch of actions that are all repetitive but not advancing the game state at all, you cannot continue to perform those repetitive actions unless you can advance the game state to a different one from what we had before. So that's the reason why you can't repeatedly tap and untap Seeker of Skybreak in order to force a draw, which is a good thing, I think we can all agree. However, some other things got caught in the crossfires there. So, for this situation, we have something a little bit similar, in that Amy can continue to tap and untap her Basalt Monolith. This time the game state is getting different. Every time she does that, she puts one card from the top of her library into her graveyard, and that'll work up until the point where she hits Emrakul. At that time, we will have entered into a loop. It'll be basically, substantially, and fundamentally the exact same situation as we had before with Seeker of Skybreak, where we're gonna keep on milling, 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 and then shuffling, shuffling everything back in. If Amy has been able to hit all of her Narc Amoebas by the time that she hits the Emrakul, then she'll get the desired outcome that she wanted, and she'll end up with all three of her Narc Amoebas in play. However, if Amy hits the Emrakul first, then we might have a little bit of an issue. Her opponent is certainly within their rights to allow Amy to continue to execute this loop. However, if the opponent does not want to let Amy continue, then that is the opponent's right. Uh, if the opponent calls a judge at that time when the Emrakul uh, gets flipped over, then that means that the judge will tell Amy uh, about this rule and will disallow any further application of the uh, milling herself. It's a little sad that this deck kind of got caught in the crosshairs, but this is the situation that we have in Magic to prevent infinite loops from ruining the games that we still could be able to play. Uh, a couple of loose ends before we finish up here. First of all, how do actual infinite combos, like for example the Splinter Twin deck function, if this is the case? Well, if you have a loop that you want to perform a bunch of times, you can do that. However, there's two conditions. You have to be able to say what the exact end state of the game will be. In this case, you know, with Splinter Twin, you aren't actually attacking for infinite, you're attacking for, say, a million or something similar to that, which is functionally the same, but an actual specific number, so it works through this rule. The other thing is, you have to be able to guarantee that after a certain number of loop iterations, your game will end up in that game state. So this is where the Four Horsemen combo, as that's what it came to be called, falls apart. Even though you can guarantee mathematically that we will eventually get into a game state where all three of Amy's Narc Amoebas are in play, we can't say a specific number at which point it's certain that it will happen. Because of that, 
this loop is not allowed the same way the splinter twin loop would be. Another interesting thing comes up if instead of Emrakul the Eons Torn, Amy had in her deck Progenitus. So this changes the character of the question a little bit because now we're guaranteed that every Basalt Monolith activation is going to either leave the number of cards in Amy's library the same or reduce it by one. We're never going to get more. However, the same problem applies. This loop has no defined number of iterations necessary to get all three of Amy's Narc Amoebas onto the battlefield with certainty. It is possible, however unlikely, that the progenitus could be shuffled into Amy's library and end up on top every single time, which means that no finite number that Amy could specify to perform the loop will actually definitely yield all three Narc Amoebas being in play. She'll just have to keep milling until she hits the progenitus, and at that point, the jig is going to be up if her opponent is savvy. There's a couple more things that we can think about. For example, the shortcut rules are pretty informal, so Nick, the opponent, doesn't need to stop the deck from functioning. However, he can if he wants to. The other kind of interesting thing about this is that even if Nick knows that Amy has Embercool or Progenitus, whichever card she might have, in her library, he can't stop the loop immediately. He has to at least wait until Amy hits that card to be milled. The reasoning is that we don't know for sure that we're in a loop yet until that happens. For example, Amy might have drawn the appropriate card and it might be in her hand. Or, if Nick saw it in a previous game, she might have sideboarded it out. As a result, we don't know for sure that the game is in a loop until after we see the Emrakul or the Progenitus or the card that fixes it so that we know that there isn't going to be a defined number of times that we'll have to proceed in order to get to the end game state. And that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Have you got any ideas for how we might want to change Magic's shortcutting rules so that cool decks like this could be allowed in the future? or at least allowed to function in a way that puts them on the same footing as all the other infinite combo decks that we do have? I'd love to know about it. It's a question I've thought about for a long time, and I haven't got an answer that really satisfies me yet. Hope you come back tomorrow for another Daily Ruin, but until then, I hope you have a great day.